Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 31st edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us for the first time. And I see by the registration, we've got plenty of our regulars. So welcome back to, to all of those. Just a quick compliance and disclaimer slide. Uh, for anybody who is joining us for the first time, just so a quick overview of the webinar. Uh, we generally run these every fortnight. More recently, we've been running them every week. Uh, it's a one hour webinar where we have two companies present a 30 minute slot for each of them. That presentation slot is generally broken down into a 20 minute presentation from the company and then we'll throw open for Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier and more efficient way to manage the Q&A session when we get to it. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded uh, and it'll be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel um, tomorrow morning. So if the presenter skips over a particular slide or you want to watch it back again tomorrow or indeed any of our previous events, um, please do check out the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. You can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter, uh, YouTube, as I said, for the recording of this event and all of our previous events, LinkedIn for some additional long form content. I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter, which you can find on the Substack newsletter platform. Our first presenter this morning is going to be Mr. Ron Hodge, the CEO of InvestSmart. And then, as I said uh, on Tuesday, we've had a slight change from what was earlier advertised. Um, uh, Field Solutions Holdings couldn't join us this morning, but I'm delighted to say we've got Mr. Greg Bader, CEO of rent.com.au, joining us as a late substitution. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we have uh, Ron waiting and ready to go on the other side. So Ron, if you want to start, start sharing your screen and I'll let you know um, when I can see the cover slide of your presentation coming up. Uh, yep, there we go. Perfect. You're ready to go, Ron. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for inviting us to Coffee Microcaps. Um, good morning, everyone. My name's Ron Hodge. I'm the CEO of InvestSmart, and I want to share with you this morning uh, our sort of like last five-year journey and, and where we are today and where we think we're going to go in the future. I think the easiest way to start, as a lot of you might not know our business, um, is it's not working. Right. Um, it's just the, the platform we've built over the last few years. I think this is a, probably a good place to start so everybody can understand our business. Our business is, is a, a wealth, uh, digital wealth platform. It has got three sort of parts. One is our funds management, and there's two parts to that, which is our professionally managed accounts, which is sort of like a robo advice model. And then we have, we listed over the last few years, three active ETFs for our intelligent investor um, analyst team. We've got about eight people in that team that pick actively, I mean, sorry, actively pick uh, Australian equities for those models. And there's a, a growth ETF and uh, an income ETF and an ethical ETF. Then we have our content publication. Many of you would know of Intelligent Investor and Eureka Report. Uh, that sort of like rounds out our ecosystem, keeps people engaged, keeps people coming to our website. Uh, and it's a real advantage to our business model, which I'll talk about later. And we have numerous tools. We have a boot camp for uh, new investors. We have a portfolio manager that that uh, monitors your investments, whether that's managed funds, shares, or whatever. Uh, and we have numerous filter tools over shares and ETFs. And this is what we call our, our platform, and it all works together. Uh, it's all on the same technology stack. And our uh, members, uh, you know, we have we have very high uh, ratings and loyalties to that to that platform. I guess over, you know, where we are today, we've built this premier direct to investor. So I think that's really important. We we don't go through advisors. We don't have instos. 
uh, we go direct to mum and dad's investors. Two thirds of our uh, subscriptions, so to ER and Intelligent Investor are actually SMSFs. And we have uh, around $300 million in that fund management business. Over the last quarter, our fees and management fees have grown about 15%. Um, so that's the March quarter that those funds under management have grown by about 17%. Our subscription incomes grown about 3.2% and our subscribers to those uh, content subscription businesses about 4.5%. Uh, as I explained, we've got three core products. We've got our professionally managed accounts, which is very similar to the robo advice models you've seen uh, here in Australia and overseas. I think the unique part about our professionally managed accounts is it's all hin based and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We've got those three ETFs with Intelligent Investor that are going very well. And we've got our subscription newsletters, which is Intelligent Investor and Eureka Report. I think that whole ecosystem, what gives us a real competitive advantage is our low cost of customer acquisition um, through our content and that uh, ecosystem. Well-recognized ambassadors, we've got Paul Clithrow on our board. Uh, Effie Zahos um, joined us last October. And Alan Kohler is our editor-in-chief for our Eureka Report content. So just a few highlights from the last quarter. Uh, as we said, fees have gone up. Our management fees for our funds gone up by about 14.7. Uh, our PMA accounts. So those PMA accounts at Robo Advice were the first, uh, well, we believe we're the first fund manager in Australia, maybe even the world, that's actually capped our fees. So for our uh, PMA, our professionally managed accounts, we really look at bums on seats and that's gone up about 19%. So we've got about 1,250 uh, investors on that platform uh, at the moment. Subscription revenue uh, went up um, by about 3% and our quarterly subscribers up by about 4.4%. That's our main revenue going forward. That's our main growth area. Um, it's what we concentrate on, which is really funds under management thumbs on seats for professionally managed accounts and our subscriber numbers. So just highlighting that again, um, funds under management now um, 2.88. Um, the subscriptions, we've got about 10,500. Uh, subscription income is about 1.224 million, up 3%. Uh, we did exceptionally well uh, last October in doing a secondary offer for our active ETF, um, the Australian Ethical Share Fund, uh, in S, that's now the top performing uh, ethical fund or listed ethical fund in Australia currently. And we raised another $17.7 .7 million for that last October. And we will continue doing the secondary raises for those intelligent investor active ETFs because it works really well for us. The interesting thing about our business is we've really transitioned it over the last five, six years. Uh, previously in Vestmark, when I first started it, um, we then, uh, in 1999, uh, we then sold it to Fairfax in 2007. That business at that stage was distributing other people's managed funds. We built that business up to about $1.8 billion in uh, funds under management or funds under advice. Uh, the recent uh, repeal of the grandfathered trailing commissions took about 40% of our revenue away. Um, and we've nearly built all that back up again in the new business model. But all those commissions ended on the 1st of January, 2021 this year. And you know we don't really need to talk about that anymore because it's our old business. And our new business, as I said, is based on our own funds under management products and our subscription products. This is how our funds under management have grown. I was actually just talking to Mark when he was at Wilson Asset Management and how when he first started there, they had about 400 million. Um, and then they celebrated when they got to a half a bill and they celebrated when they got to a bill and now they're about four bill. We're very much on a similar sort of trajectory. Um, the only difference is we don't take, as I said, institutional money. We don't take um, advisor money as such. Uh, it is all direct to the client. That means we have very sticky clients, um, and but it's a slow burn. It takes uh, a long time to build up that trust with those clients. But once it starts going, you can see sort of like how you get that geometric growth in your fund numbers. 
just breaking it down into the two different parts. So, you know, as I said, we're up to about nearly 300 million um, at the end of March. Uh, that's made up of uh, nearly half half. So, uh, the professionally managed accounts, those capped fee funds, they're all based on ETFs. Uh, so each model has about six to eight ETFs in it. You have the normal uh, conservative balanced growth and high growth. And then we also have asset class specific ones, international fixed interest, Australian equities and uh, property infrastructure. Those um, PMAs now are up to about just over 120 million and growing really, really nicely. The interesting part about this is how we pick those ETFs. It's all algorithmically, which is really where that global advice comes, which keeps our fees low, which allows us to, keeps our costs low, sorry, which allows us to cap our fees. The uh, active ETFs, that's up to about 160 odd million now, um, growing very strongly, the performance has been very strong, obviously in a rising tide with the uh, ASX and, and markets around the world. Uh, we do not cap fees on this. We do have low fees, no performance fees, and it's 0.97% um, for those three listed funds. What we really see with our subscribers, by the way, or with our investors, is a lot of them do the core satellite. So they might invest part of their money into our PMA, the sort of like boring um, passive uh, ETF models uh, with capped fees. They get full reporting. Um, so we have a lot of people ask us, you know, can't I just go buy the ETS myself? We go, yes, you can. But if you think you can do that for $451, pick the right ETFs. Not every ETF is the same as another ETF. Um, our algorithms that pick those ETFs uh, are based on liquidity, spread, um, tracking error. And so we, we curate those portfolios based on risk profiles for the customers, full tax reporting, full rebalancing throughout the year. Um, and we believe that at $451, it's actually 55 basis points up to $82,000. Um, and then that basically caps out at $451. So what's our P&L look like at the moment? As I said, we lost that legacy business in um, on the 1st of January. So that was about $240,000 that we got last quarter that we didn't get this quarter. Uh, our funds management is now about 402 subscriptions, 1.2 million. We still have an insurance book because that didn't get repealed underneath the, the grandfathered trails um, stuff. So we get about 350 from that. So we're making about 2 million bucks a year. We've still got expenses of just slightly more than that, but we believe the growth in those funds management subscription business, if we do a similar growth to last year, we're well and truly break um, past break even uh, sometime over the next sort of 12 months uh, if we continue on this trajectory. Cash in bank uh, is strong. Um, we've got nearly you know, five million bucks. We don't envisage on having to use that that much, um, and uh, you know, but it's a nice safety net to have. So really, going back into the advantages of our business, and I think it's unique to InvestSmart. I mean, we have built this over the last few years. As I said, we bought back InvestSmart uh, in 2013. Um, we then bought Intelligent Investor in 2015. We bought Eureka Report in 2016. And it's really content is king. It's really this, this content we get from these other publications allows us to drive a lot of traffic to our website. And that traffic then we use to convert. It's all on the same technology stack. We use SaaS systems like Salesforce Marketo to automatically or dynamically talk with our clients. Um, and that allows us to get a really good conversion rate, um, nearly up to like seven, eight percent for subscriptions and three or four percent for our fund management business, which is actually improving as we get better and better at doing this. Uh, obviously, Paul, Effie, and, and Alan uh, are key to building trust with the um, direct to retail, and they also write for these publications. So talking about, again, that low fee, you know, by doing it algorithmically, um, we don't have uh, loads of fund managers or portfolio managers in the business. We do on the intelligent investor side, but on the InvestSmart side for cap fees, uh, as I said, we do it algorithmically. We've got those single asset class portfolios and also the diversified portfolios. 
Um, and that allows us to really be smart. It's all HIN based. So we have a lot of clients who love the fact that really what we're doing for them is managing a portfolio of ETFs on their behalf. At any stage, they decide that they don't want us to manage their money. They can either sell um, their portfolios with us and we give them back their money, or they can actually transfer the HIN over to their own broker and take over the management of that process themselves. It means their portfolios are very portable, which is unique, I think, to how we see robo advice in, in this country. Uh, intelligent investor, I talked about, we've got INIF, IGIF, and INS, those three ETFs, so INIF, IIGF, down in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, and the ethical fund, which is INS. So that low cost per customer acquisition, I think, is key for us. We don't really start, we don't really like using words like fintech and, and AI and all that sort of stuff, but we do all that naturally. I think from a fintech sort of point of view, um, if you wanted to put us in that category, the problem with uh, fintechs or any sort of startup is really that cost per acquisition. And by having all of this free content, we get um, you know, several million unique visitors a year to our uh, platform and we convert those guys over time. We've got about 700,000 700,000 Australians registered uh, into that ecosystem. And we send out emails continuously based on their dynamic profiling. So if we know they've got um, a certain stock in their portfolio that they, that they, um, they manage through us, then we can send them code content uh, relative to whatever their holdings are. We know what they're reading. We pretty much um, record every stroke of the keyboard that they make on our um, ecosystem, on our, on our platform. So that content and tools, the investment solutions, that all forms one platform, which allows us to uh, really get a low cost per acquisition, um, you know, $30 per client, um, depending on when we're doing campaigns above the line. As I said before, I think it's really hard to, you know, we're sort of like quite unique in a lot of ways, um, but we've tried to come up with sort of proxies with similar businesses on the ASX. Um, we're sort of like a minnow down in the left-hand corner there at about 23 million market cap. As I said, we've got about 288 million of funds under management. You can see the other guys in this niche and mid-size area. Um, we believe we're growing quite quickly, so, I think we'll, we'll overtake some of these guys um, in the not too distant future. I think on the large side, where you look at net wealth and premium and hub 24, I would really call that sort of the, the first um, uh, evolution of platforms. We really believe that HIN based platforms are better. We think that the Australian Stock Exchange is probably one of the best platforms on the market, so why not use them? Um, and so, we think that at some stage, people will actually start looking at capping fees. They will start looking at uh, HIN-based models such as InvestSmart. Uh, again, a lot of these companies don't have that content ecosystem uh, around them that gives them that, that low cost per acquisition. But remember, a lot of these guys, or most of those guys on this screen, are also going through advisors who can change their mandate and take money out um, at a whim. Uh, and a lot of them have got institutional money as well. Um, with the same sort of repercussions if those institutes want to change their mandates. Our capital structure, so this was, um, so that uh, 22 million market cap was at 16 and a half cents where we are now. Uh, we have 138 million shares on issue. Uh, 18 million of those shares are uh, employee uh, director share option plan. Those options are a third, a third, a third, vesting over three years at um, 15 cents, 20 cents, and 30 cents. Uh, so you can see uh, a lot of those options are currently out of the money. Uh, cash at bank, as we said, 4.76 billion. We do have some of these uh, financial assets. So if you look at our accounts, you'll see that we've talked about um, in our previous business prior to me becoming CEO, we had a number of um, we did so like a venture capital type um, arm of our business, and we invested in a number of ventures, one of those being Spriggy. Um, 
and those assets are currently um, valued on the balance sheet of about 1.97 million. We've always told the market that if a liquidity event, whether they float or whether they do some sort of capital raising, we'll always look to um, get out of those uh, investments um, when and if we can. Our major shareholders, we've got Leyland's at 18.94, Perpetual at 10, and myself at 9.39. So this is our board um, and our main guys. We've got Paul, uh, Mike Shepherd, great to have on board, Effie, myself, Alan, and Alistair Davidson, who's head of funds. That's just a little bit about investment. I think before I just conclude and, and go to questions, just wanted to show you in the appendices of this slides uh, the products that we do cover. Um, as I said, the PMA is across those diversified ones and across some asset class specific. We've got the intelligent investor ones below. Uh, you've got the performance, which is going very, very well for our active ETFs. And I think what's interesting is the PMA uh, and why our clients just keep on coming back to it and investing more money and telling their friends and family, is that the algorithms really work. So over five years, we really compare ourselves to peers. So if we compare ourselves to benchmark, we'll be, you know, if we're doing our job properly, which we are, we'll track the index, less our fees, um, but really we're looking at peers. So we wanna make sure that we're beating most of our peers. Uh, and so we look at those peers in these algorithms uh, and then we beat them on, on fees, basically. We, we, we match them on the average in regards to asset allocation, and then we look to beat them on fees because we believe fees over the long term is one of the biggest factors affecting performance. So, for example, our conservative fund, we look at this on a $10,000 investment. Um, we're at 55 basis points. Remember, if you had $100,000 or a $1 million invested in these portfolios, your fees would only be $451, uh, so the fees can go down even further. But if you look at the 528 peers, um, they're about 1.43%. So we're still about a percent better in fees than um, the average of, of all of our peers. And so we think that that will continue. We think it's very hard for fund managers and the other platforms to meet us on these fees because they've got such huge cost structures already built up over time based on their old fee structures, which is um, you know, what we would consider pretty high fee levels. So thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I'd love to be able to answer. Thanks, Rania. The question has been coming through thick and fast. So let's, uh, let's rattle through them here. Have you got a rule of thumb about management and performance fees structure across the the funds management business, like how, how people should kind of think about it, I guess. Um, sorry, are you talking about from an investor's point of view? As uh, in a, a, yeah, did, that's going to come flow back through to the business. You know, should we think about it? I think the question is more, you know, if funds under management is, is let's say that half a billion, you know, that's going to kind of flow back you're going to earn 0.6% on that. I think maybe that's kind of where that, the question is. Yeah, so our, our average is a little bit higher than that. So, you know, if, you, if you're getting 97 basis points from uh, the uh, intelligent investor active funds, and we've got half of our fund in that, and then you've got the uh, half the fund in the PMA, that's 55 basis points capped at 451. The average fees across at the moment is, is more like 70 basis points. Um, but I, I think the really interesting thing, Mark, for that question is it really does work like an ecosystem. We're doing a lot more work. Uh, I think Magellan does it really, really well in their, in their sort of like club idea, which is really, if, you know, once you're inside the club, you've invested in a product, you get discounts and stuff um, in future products. We see a lot of our clients, not only are they, are they a subscriber to Intelligent Investor, for example, so they're paying us six or $700 for a subscription. They also invest in one or all of the ETFs. And why they do that, Mark, is that a lot of our, a lot of our subscribers go, well, I don't actually want to buy the whole 22 stocks you have in your portfolio, so I'll buy the ETF. And then 
I'll go a little bit overweight in the in the in the three or four I really like in that portfolio, if that makes sense. And then they also buy, you know, that core satellite structure. They also buy into the PMA. So we're getting clients doing all three. We're getting, you know, I'd say majority of our clients are still only doing one product. Um, but we are starting to see people getting into two and even three products. And so the way we look at it is that that lifetime value of a client. And we're doing a lot of work now. I can't really tell you the exact figures um, because we haven't actually um, published that. Uh, but we're really doing a lot of work on that lifetime value of a client and how we make sure we solve their problems, but by providing additional products that are relevant to them. Okay, great. And next one is under, I guess, this uh, newsletter business, publication business. Do you have a breakdown of the mix of subscribers by monthly and annual subscription plans uh, and any insights on, you know, what the churn rate is um, overall? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that business is awesome and we've spent a lot of work on getting that up. I mean, our our retention rates now for uh, our subscription business, both ER and II, is uh, just slightly over 90%, so call it 90%, which is you know it's it's incredible i mean the they have retention rates up that high and and we've maintained those retention rates even if you go back to some of our quarterly reports from last year we were still recording those sort of retention rates so we've we've worked really hard and i think that comes down to that ecosystem and the and the systems we've we've spent a lot of time making sure that when we send people content it's relative to what they actually want to read and i think that's really important to keeping that high retention um, I think from a monthly to a uh, yearly, most of our subscribers would be yearly and bundled. So we have three products. We have uh, ER, which is our, our um, sort of like first general information, general financial investment information. That's a sort of like recommended retail price is about 330. We have intelligent investor at 770, which is really that analyst um, recommendations. And then we have a bundle, so you can buy the two together. Um, which obviously, if you add those two prices, eleven hundred, but um, we discount that to eight eighty. So it's sort of like three thirty, seven seventy, eight eighty. Uh, majority of our clients would be on the bundle. Um, majority of clients are um, yearly. We do have about two thousand, somewhere around there, that are monthly. Um, and mainly on ER, and that's really just a legacy. So, Mark, you remember I said we bought that business in 2015. Um, Alan Fowler, when he ran that, he was he was big on on monthlies, and so you know, a lot of people just have stayed on on monthlies and haven't gone to yearly. Okay, great. And next one, the the plan to grow the active ETF fund is that a, I guess, a combination of further cap raises and new products or, or where's the kind of yes. focus going yes, so, forward? Yeah, so the ecosystem sort of like, you just have that organic stuff that just because you get, you know, thousands and thousands of people every month joining up to your services, trialing your subscription, downloading PDFs, downloading invest packs, whatever else, we get a natural organic. Then you get people telling friends and family because we have really high retention rates and really high ratings on reviews um, sort of sites. Um, but I think what we've really come around to in the last probably six months is because it's retail mums and dads, because it's direct to market, you can't just expect everybody to come to your website and do something. You really have to uh, market a, a unique selling proposition, one product, um, and, and, and you know build collateral around why an investor. So, we've, for example, we've just done the conservative portfolio in the PMA. Uh, two weeks, we did a. Um, we got lots of stories written by Effie and Alan and um, whatever else about why uh, you know people should put um, some of their you know if they've got term deposits. We saw Westpac came out and said you know twelve billion dollars went into twelve more sorry twelve billion more dollars went into term deposits last quarter. So the, the market is awash with cash. And so we did a campaign around, you know, we're not saying the conservative portfolio is like um, a term deposit. You are taking a little bit more extra risk with about 25% equities in that, 
in that portfolio. But we really believe that you and and the way we we sort of like pitched the the campaign was around, you know, don't put all your money into term deposits. Put some of it into something that's going to beat inflation. And we think the conservative portfolio doing about four or five percent is a good way to do that. Um, it went really really well, and we'll report that at the end of this month. Um, sorry, at the end of this quarter. But I think that the the how you grow active and how you grow the passive um, or the or the capped fee capped fee products is by doing internal marketing programs to them. So that was what the ENS was. It was a secondary offer um, and it worked really, really well. So we'll continue to do that every six months. We'll probably do the income, um, the active ETF income portfolio, uh, IINF, uh, INIF, sorry, INIF um, in probably July. And, and we expect it to do as, as well uh, as INS. Okay, great. Ron, we're pushing up on time. Actually, we're a little bit over time. There's a, a few more questions we didn't get to, but if anybody wants to email yourself or Andrew directly, um, they can. Uh, thank you very much for coming on and joining us to, this morning. Um, it was great to get to hear the story firsthand. If I could ask you, please, to just stop sharing your screen, because okay. I know Greg, our second presenter, is waiting in the wings. Okay, thanks very much, Mark, and thanks everybody else for listening. Thanks, Ron. So, Greg, if you want to start sharing your screen, I'll let you know when the, the cover slide comes up. Oh, yeah. uh, do you need to allow my video? Uh, no, we don't. That'll be fine. If you can just share the screen, Greg, that'd be great. I'll uh, we get this presentation up and going. Yeah, it's coming through now, Greg. And uh, just go to presentation mode, just so we get it on the, on the full screen. Should I have it now? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. You're ready to go, Greg. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks very much, Mark, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Vader, CEO of rent.com.au. Um, we listed in 15. I've been with the business since 16, so coming up to five years. We've had a bit of a change since then, and, and what I'm going to do, we've got a lot of information on our um investor center and, and on the ASX, et cetera. So this is just a little bit of a introduction into uh, what we do now and, and what we're planning to do tomorrow. So the, the first thing about us is, as you can probably tell by our name, we focus on renters. Um, really interesting segment. And look, Australia is quite unique in the property world. We, we have a fascination with it. Um, for too long, renting's kind of been seen as that second class choice or, or somehow it's, it's not preferred to, to home ownership. And, and what we're seeing recently, and, and it's accelerating over the last five years, there's a, there's a real change in, in attitude uh, of renters. So if we look at our millennial group, which is our largest segment, um, a subset of them is what we call our logical renter. And these are people that are renting because it's entirely practical in their situation. They're, they're, they're better educated than the generations before. They're more financially literate. They're mobile. They don't see property ownership as necessarily their only vehicle to build wealth. They, they're, they're strong into equities and more recently crypto, et cetera. Um, and more importantly, they have a, they have a better balance or, or a different view of a balance between lifestyle and flexibility. Um, you know, and, that, and that's reflective of the way work is now, people travel, et cetera. So, our mission, if you like, is to make the renting process a little bit more, uh, less cumbersome, uh, less onerous, less con confrontational, just make it a little bit easier and, and recognise renters and reward renters as we go through. 32% of our population rent, it's going up every year. So we started off, we, we run a portal, uh, rent.com.au. We're in the top four portals in Australia. No surprise who number one is, rea.com.au. Great business, multi-billion dollar business. 
But like uh, number one and two, they're really focused on the agent side. 90% of their revenues come from real estate agents. For us, our revenues don't come from real estate agents. They come from the consumer. We face the consumer. So there's a few stats there on our site. A um, couple of interesting ones. We, we are about 75% of our traffic is organic. That means people are coming naturally to us. And, and I appreciate that a lot of mum and dad investors have probably not really heard of us. What we're as a small cap, we don't have a huge marketing budget. What we do spend is directly towards our renters, and be given our age demographic, as you can imagine, most of that's through social channels, etc. Interesting um, other stat on our traffic: we we run about seventy five percent new users every month, and that's reflective of the na nature of renting. If I look at Domain's most recent half yearly domain run at 21% uh, new users each month. And once again, that's reflective of their, their strong weighting in the sales side. And that's mums and dads checking out the neighbor's property or whatnot. So flipping that back to us, 75% new users, our people are very transactional. Um, we have most of the properties in Australia. We follow um, population in terms of where the listings are. We have a slight um, as, as a nation, we have a slight bias towards southern uh, Queensland is, is a higher renting per capita than, than other areas. And it's been a tough year. Um, in April, just gone, so two weeks ago, I looked at the data. We had 17,000 less properties available in Australia to rent than we did the year before. Uh, every state uh, had less other than Victoria. And we had a number of states, uh, Western Australia, Queensland, we were approaching, you know, 1% vacancy rates. So it's been a, it's been a pretty tough time for, for renters. We, most of our um, customers consume us via apps and we're really proud of the fact that our apps rate as, as the number one real estate apps in Australia. The um, Business has had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we listed in 15. When, when I joined the business, we were burning over a million a month. Um, our business model was flawed. We, we threw that in the bin. We started again and, and we really, we built our business around focusing on the consumer, talking to the customers um, and, and understanding what their pain points and challenges were and then building products and solutions to suit that. We, you know, I, we can't compete on cash terms with REA and Domain, but where we can compete with them on, a, on an equal or even slightly ahead is engaging with our consumers. Renting is, is all we do. So for other people, renters are just a um, something they need to do to complete the portfolio, whether it's you know sale, lease, et cetera. For us, it's all we do. So we're really proud of the fact we've got our core business profitable. We've got products in market that no one else has. Our rent bond products are really interesting product. It's, it's the largest um, bond finance product in the market. And, and it's a really good example of how you can make a product that, that, that's a finance product. You can make it attractive to the consumer, but also fill a need. So, so at the moment, when you rent a property in Australia, you're, there is legislation around your old bond being returned, but for most people, they need to front up with a new bond to secure their new property before the old one's released. So we, we lend people two and a half, three thousand dollars to to cover that new bond. And if you pay us back within 21 days, e.g. when the old bond's released, then there's zero charge. So it has a kind of a buy now, pay later type flavor to it. So those are the sort of products and services, and we have a number of them that's allowed us to get our business to where it is. As I said, we're the largest renter channel in the country. Um, really proud of what we've achieved. Renting's huge. Um, the, the bit on the left there, rent is what we do today. The, the, it's a great business, um, but one of the challenges is we only see people for four to six weeks. Um, that's the average search window of when someone's looking for a property. And I'll be honest, it's a fairly stressful time for people. So they come in, they do their business over four to six weeks, and then they're off. Where we want to move to and where we think we've earned the right to is move into the tenancy phase. Now, the tenancy phase obviously is people happy in their home. On average in Australia, it's 30 months. There's a whole bunch of households out there. Um, from a market opportunity size for us, it's it's over 20 times larger in terms of, terms of earning potential. So we're, we've built our relationship with the consumer on our portal business with rent, and we're moving that towards uh, rent pay. 
RentPay, in essence, I guess, is a, is a digital wallet. We've been really, um, we're playing with people's money. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of security built around this. So the rent rent pay wallet's held in a trust structure through through ANZ Bank. And what it, what it simply does is, is it allows full flexibility to the consumer and certainty back to the landlord. We've also managed to build in some quite interesting uh, features and functions recognize renters and, and renting recognition of renting past history standing uh, are major bugbears for, for customers so that's what we're addressing i guess there's a, there's a few of the features here so if you if you think of the average real estate agent they're running a small business they're focused on pnl efficiency and whatnot they've got 50 renters they would prefer prefer all those renters to pay on the first tuesday of the month it keeps everything simple and consistent on the consumer side, the consumers want flexibility. They want to be able to synchronize their rent with their payday, or rather than paying monthly, they'd rather pay weekly. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting um, components to all this, and there's a there's a bunch of interesting features, and and together they make up a pretty uh, compelling package. A couple of the really interesting ones that we've brought to market the rent money dead money not anymore so for the first time in australia we've created a structure and a product that recognizes a renter for their continuous renting contribution so each time you pay your rent per month will increment your credit score and the theory behind this is that someone that comes in uh, rents for a number of years and eventually transitions into a mortgage will have built their financial credibility uh, improved their financial credi credibility over that journey. So it's a really interesting concept, um, first time in Australia. The, the buffers are uh, an important one and, and it's kind of a bit of a reflection on our, on our society at the moment. We're having a, a lot of our millennial users are on part-time or casual type employment. They, they may need to take holidays in three or four months time. They're not going to be earning during that that period so the buffer and we had really strong response and the little blue dots there are the percentage of customers indicating they wanted this the building a buffer allows you to get in front um, you can see it it's held in your wallet held in trust and you know in three weeks time if you don't have um, if you can't afford it this week or you would rather not spend your own money on the rent your buffer can um, take care of that for you uh, it's all visible there are inside the app there are various scheduling forecasting calendar functions that, that allow you to see and how to grow and how much you have and all that the the safety net's another interesting one we it was interesting we um when we built this product we had over 2000 customers involved in the creation of the product and the initial response was only 35% only 35% wanted some sort of safety net availability. And the, the scenario here is that if your car blows up on Monday and your rent's due on Thursday, then we'll lend you the, the money. Um, but when we built the product and we, we went back to the base, 100% of the people like the fact that it's there. They may not use it, or more importantly, they may not think they need to use it, but they have comfort in the fact that something's there. As you, as you build, renting's a competitive space and renters will will do anything they can to remove the impact of one negative on their renting history because they know it'll affect them on their next rental their next rental so this is really important that we've built in a payment structure on this as well that we think is really interesting so if we will lend you 500 dollars for your rent and we will charge you two dollars a week um, interest or a fee on that until you pay back the principal you can pay back the principal the next day or you can pay it in installments for installments similar to afterpay so really good value product but it provides that surety back to the customer it's transformational for our business we launched the product last week um, it's a massive market a couple of really important things it takes us into an annuity model for our revenue at the moment with our portal business we sell all our products on monday we need to sell them again on tuesday and i guess more importantly this is a this is a platform that will layer on other services um, utilities banking finance products there's a whole range of products we we can put in here insurance is a really interesting one we used to have an insurance product um, we pulled it because 
trying to sell that contents insurance product to someone right in the middle of moving house just wasn't the right time. Once they're in their property and they're comfortable, this is the vehicle we can put that back in. And probably the most important thing about rent pay is all the existing payment solutions in the market today are built for the real estate agent. You, as a seller of one of those platforms, you go to a real estate agent, you sell that product to the real estate agent, the real estate agent then convinces renters to use the product. Ours faces the other way. Ours will take, the consumer will consume our product, take our product, and then we are transparent to the real estate agent. Um, so the real estate agent um, is not an active participant in this on, on this initial phase. We certainly, um, we already have an existing payments platform um, that has a lot of agent features in there. And our next phase of development is rolling those features in. So right now, if a consumer starts paying this using this service, there is no impact to the real estate agent. In fact, that's not true. There is a positive impact because we're using NPP, um, New Payments Platform, Instant Payments as our method to pay. We're using that because there exists today a problem where a, a tenant pays their rent on Wednesday. It possibly doesn't clear till Friday. It creates uncertainty and angst between the real estate agent and the renter. Mm -hmm. Using NPP Instant to solve that. Um, so that's, that's why we've implemented that way. Um, and look, last slide, we've, we've set ourselves some very big targets. We, we truly do believe that this is um, transformational to the market. I would like to think in two years time, this is the way you pay your rent. In terms of bringing it to market, we already own Australia's largest renting channel. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we launched the product last week. We're slowly ramping up our marketing. Uh, social media, our own channels will be the prime vehicles. Discussions are already underway, utilities, banking, retail. We already partner with AGL, for example. We do about 10% of AGL's net ads in the connection space. Moving AGL or a similar utility into the rent pay space allows us to do things like high frequency payments. So rather than consuming electric and gas for three months, then 30 days to pay, we can synchronize that uh, with your rental frequency, whether that be weekly, fortnightly, or monthly. And the, the impact of that is, is massive. At 10% market share and moving utility customers to pay at the same frequency as their rent is a $50 million cash flow improvement to that utility. What's more interesting, it has an equal impact in their bad debt. People are much more likely to service a $50 outstanding bill than a $500 bill. So it's really interesting uh, impacts on other areas and other segments. Uh, it's disruptive in market, tough to follow. As I mentioned, we, we have our own channel um, that comes along for the ride, which is, is rent.com.au. Just launched, um, we're, we're going through a process of optimization. It's in the app stores. And um, yeah, we're really excited. And this is, we, we see this as the wealth vehicle for our business. And that was it, short and sharp. Um, happy to answer any questions. Alternatively, people can email us at investors. That gets straight to me. And um, yeah, back to you, Mark. Hey, great. Yeah, we haven't got any just yet, but uh, maybe I'll just kick off uh, and, and get the ball rolling. Um, one of the things I was interested in, you, you talked about um, you know, the lack of rental supply in some of the markets. Over the last year with, you know, tourism being, especially international tourism, knocked on the head, have you seen, you know, a lot of Airbnb properties, you know, going from that Airbnb model to, you know, longer term rental models or, you know, the lack of uh, inbound immigration? Has that disrupted the business, been a positive for the business or, you know, has it shown up in your numbers anywhere, you know, the effect of all of the kind of, COVID-19 restrictions and the, the knock-ons? Look, all of them, all of the, all of the above have an effect. And, and, and an interesting market to watch, I guess, is Hobart. Um, and, I, and I'm not picking on Hobart, great city, but it, uh, because of its small size, you, the impacts tend to be um, quite profound. So Hobart's been through a um, hot and cold. So we saw probably 18 months ago, um, had a really good run economically. Um, a lot of tourism, uh, a lot of 
the larger properties moved to Airbnb, which caused a shortage in the market uh, and it caused a lot of rent stress. COVID hit, obviously some of those properties have come back in. So overall, you know, if we look at nationally, and I'm and when I say nationally, I'm mainly talking about the major cities and, and not so much regional Australia, the um, we've got less properties today than we did have a, a year ago. So certainly if we still did have high net immigration, then that problem would be worse. The, you know, we've got current markets are pretty hot on the sales side at the moment, uh, especially uh, Sydney, Queensland, Western Australia. So we're seeing um, that have an impact as well. We'll stop, we were talking to a real estate agent the other morning and they, um, they've got 18 properties that they've just sold. Uh, every one of those properties was a rental property. So there's 18 renters that, are, that will um, be dislodged from those properties. And now obviously a bunch of those buyers would have also been renters. So the, the net is not 18, but yeah, as you know, every, every time a market runs hot, the, the rentings kind of lags a little bit. So it obviously affects availability and pricing as well. So the, the, I guess the summary is the markets for renting are, are tougher today than they were a, a year ago. Okay. And then the, I guess a follow on question from that is, so is, in terms for your business, is it is it better to have high rents, uh, and or is it better to have you know kind of lower rents and greater availability? Or are you kind of like market agnostic whether there's a lot of stock and low rents or not a lot of stock and high rents? Is it is it, is it does it really matter which kind of market we're in? Look, in terms of earning potential for our business, um, you know, when, when people are moving, that's when we, um, today, that's, that's how we make our money, by selling products and services to assist you to, to move a property. Um, the, the, you know, at a broader level, our mission is, is around making the renting process uh, more rewarding. So, yeah, that, that kind of doesn't really factor in for us. Our, our, our mission is to, to grow our audience and then evoke change on the industry. So rent pays certainly insulates us from any cyclic nature of renting. Um, everybody, you know, it's 32% of the population are out there paying rent. So paying through rent pay, the product is transportable from property to property. So that, that insulates our business. But um, Look, I think we're better as a community when there's a balance. Um, there's been various legislations gone through at a state level over the last 12 months that are trying to address that balance between the balance of power. Um, people need a place to live. We've got, you know, I, I think fundamentally our industry needs a bit of a bit of a change. We've, we're, um, you know, we're greater than 90% of our properties are mum and dad's only investment property that impacts lease security, which is a big issue if you imagine. And once again, I'm not talking about people that necessarily have to rent. I'm talking about people that choose to rent. So, you know, we may have mum and dad and a couple of kids that have moved into a specific suburb to put their kids through high school. They probably own a property elsewhere. They've moved in and, and you know, that, that concern that they don't have that lease security that they may be required to move because the owner's circumstances have changed. They're the sort of things we'd like to, to see fixed. And certainly there's been some changes federally that allow uh, some of the superannuation funds to consider rent purpose-built rent to um, build to rent facilities. Uh, we think that's great to get a better mix of stock in the market. Um, but yeah, none of those things greatly affect our, our business. We, we face the consumer, it's 32% of the consumers are renting. Uh, they're not going anywhere and we're the largest channel that uh, serves them. Okay. And one final one for me, if I know you briefly touched on, you know, the plans to uh, activate that agent channel, but if we take, you know, somebody like McGrath, who's, you know, also listed and you can see they've got like a huge rent roll book across their, um, uh, you know, franchise model and their, and their, and their owned businesses, you know, is, is, is that a kind of a key channel to market moving forward or, or I guess, how do you pitch it to, you know, somebody like McGrath's in terms of how it can really 
save their franchisees time, effort, stress? Um, so it's a it's a good question, and and certainly part one of rent pay is focused on the consumer, but there certainly is an agent opportunity uh, coming through. So we already have a payments platform that agents use. We we do about eight million dollars a month of rent through that one at the moment. We'll be moving that across to our new platform. The selling it to agents is, I mean, other than the tactical, you know, having humans out on the street banging on doors, the actual model is quite simple. We've done time and motion studies with two franchise offices locally. Um, a five hour job becomes a five minute job in terms of reconciliation. The big one, the two big ones though are, we allow the agency to run a simple, consistent model of monthly, 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 and we offer full flexibility on the consumer side. So the agents don't need to worry about that anymore. The second part of that is we're building in a new revenue line for real estate agents that hasn't hit the market yet. So we believe by having a real estate agent being part of rent pay, we'll present them with new opportunities to earn uh, income outside of their current structure and, and, and the benefits that increasing their rent rolls, et cetera. So we'll, um, we'll be bringing that to market over the next few months. Okay, great. If we don't have a question from the audience, I think we're yeah, slightly pushing up on time. So I think Greg, we leave it. We leave it there for this morning. Thank you very much for yeah, presenting and also uh, a thanks from me for uh, coming in at the at the last minute. Um if yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch, it's uh, investors at rent.com.au. And as I said, the recording will be up on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning, about 9, 9.30. And uh, we'll leave it there. And I, I wish everybody a good rest of their Thursday. No problem. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, Greg. Cheers.